give up another hand for Arden. Our next speaker is Andrew Dodson. He was born in South Carolina, graduating with a BS in mathematics and electrical engineering from Clemson University. He was the co-founder of two startups in the area of networked infrastructure. His interests include social dynamics of energy consumption, embedded devices, sustainability, agriculture, power systems, control theory, and nuclear power. In his spare time, Andrew enjoys arguing on the internet and working out. Actually, I, I, I keep my arguing to Twitter and Facebook largely. Can we kill the lights? Oh, all right. Um, F5, F5. All right, so this is going to be a pretty holistic talk. I'm going to have to run through pretty quick a, a fairly comprehensive view of a pretty large subject. Bear with me. It's going to be logical. Okay, so the green meme, truth about energy and First, we got to look at the motivations. We got to examine the proposed solutions, and then we got to get past the meme. All right, so what is the green meme? Well, it's not these green memes. Um, it's this. Why in the world is this man putting a diaper on a cow and collecting farts? You know, a, a generation ago, we'd put him in an insane asylum. This was done right outside of Los Angeles. We reward this man. We say what he does has social value. You know, he's part of the green meme. This idea, this behavior, this style that is pervasive throughout our culture. You know, all of these people are very concerned about the green meme. They want you to be green. You got a lot of smart people TED talking about green. You know, this is somehow vital to our survival as a species. So what's, let's, let's kind of look at some background. What is the big deal with energy? Where do we get our energy? Do we have enough energy? Largely, over three quarters of our energy comes from burning some form of carbon. The next largest form of energy is nuclear, and then about 2% is hydro. Um, energy needs are growing massively, largely in the developing world. Okay. The most ancient form of energy is burning wood. The next most ancient form of energy, you could argue they're about the same time, is burning poop. Indeed, over two billion people in our world will, with their bare hands, take a cow poop and they'll mix it with some sawdust and then they'll slap that against the side of their house and let it dry for a couple days and then they burn that to cook dinner um, so burning feces is toxic very toxic you know surprise this actually applies to all organics so they're burning crap indoors and they're killing themselves Okay, um, feel free to pause some of these if you're watching online. I'm going to go through a lot without explaining everything. Okay, so the next most ancient source of energy, you know, water as to balance fire. You know, it, it brought industry to the ancient world. Humanity actually expanded following water. You know, up until the 1900s, you know, the entire expansion of America followed a lot of rivers, you know, for industrial and reasons of trade. Grain is still milled this way, even in first world nations. Um, so you, you say, well, how has hydro evolved? Well, we're building some huge dams today, largely because all of the cost-effective, medium-sized river flows with large um, height drops to provide pressure head are already built out. We're having to go to some pretty big extremes to build dams. Please check out a documentary called Democracy. So, when a large dam fails, it can kill anywhere from tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of people. Indeed, the, the risks 
proposed environmentally, Belo Verde Dam across the Amazon, this is going to put one third of the freshwater species of the fish in the Amazon basin at risk of extinction. I mean, we're going, we're going crazy doing this stuff. Um, so the energy is, is nuclear. Um, according to some sources, uh, everyone in California tragically died four years ago from getting exposed to 750 rads. Um, I'm, I'm proud y'all have recovered so quickly. California, good job. Um, this is the nuclear that we know, Homer Simpson, um, laughing and eating donuts at a large control station. You know, we've all seen food major source of electricity in the developed world, which is coal. Now, in America, we've largely matured in the rates of coal that we use, but don't worry, because we're going to keep on mining more and more of it, because the developing world is now building fossil fuel energy, so they can stop burning poo-poo. And what's interesting is the form of coal that they're going to use is going to be the cheapest form of coal, the most polluting form of coal, dirty brown lignite. The poop of coals. Um, so coal has some pretty big repercussions. I mean, th this poor fella in West Virginia, I ain't seen nothing like this. And you know, like a, a, a chemical, some coal ash, uh, some, some of the byproducts of the coal industry will spill in a river and kill everything in the river for the foreseeable future. I mean, and this happens on a regular basis. It's just not reported that much. I mean, in Tennessee, in Appalachia, you know, we're, we're bulldozing the beautiful mountains of West Virginia. We're, we're, we're destroying our environment to get at this resource and export it across the world. So moving on to not the, ma the major source of electricity, but the major source of worldwide energy, is oil, largely because of its consumption as a transportation fuel. Um, thankfully, we transition from whale oil to oil out of the ground. So, you know, there's at least a couple whales left, like 1% out of the hundreds of thousands that did used to exist. Um, John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company did a lot to um, really get the oil industry going. Um, there was this big thing, he got broken up in 1911 and the fragments of Standard Oil and the Rockefeller legacy became the many companies of our modern oil industry. So what are the downsides of oil? Well, oil no longer skyrockets out of the ground like it did when we first put a well in Texas a hundred years ago. There's this concept, energy return on energy invested. E-R-O-E-I or E-R-O-I. It started off at 100, where, well actually, 1,000. Um, you know, when we first started pulling oil out of the ground. Nowadays, with techniques like fracking and drilling in deep water, they're very risky, they're very energy intensive. I mean, I, I hope you all remember Deepwater Horizon, which is still leaking, which has, you know, just completely obliterated a large section of the Gulf seafloor. You know, refineries are exploding now because the qualities of oil we're putting into them are non-conventional, or, or have a lot of hydrogen sulfide, are very toxic. Um, so you have the other fossil fuel, natural gas, okay? It does burn more cleanly in gas turbines that can better respond to variations in load. So effectively, natural gas has kind of helped us um, integrate certain renewable resources, as we'll see in a little bit. But sadly, it's a higher cost than other forms of fossil fuels, and a, a fracked well that I drill is really only effectively productive for about five years. I mean, the, the return on that well drops off exponentially. Okay. However, natural gas is freedom. We are building over five major natural gas liquefaction ports across our land. And, you know, look at where the year 2016 is on this graph. Think of how much natural gas we use. We're going to go to a bazillion times more natural gas and export that all across the globe. And we're going to waste half of the natural gas in transporting it and compressing it and refrigerating it as we ship it. I mean, we're just, we're, we're, we're going crazy trying to utilize fossil fuels. I mean, um, imagine, you know, I get a, I get a unit of energy X. 
and it costs one half X to even extract it and make it useful. I mean, you're gonna like, we could very well get to the point to where X unit of energy requires X unit of energy. I mean, our entire society would do nothing but extract fossil fuels because it would require so much work. So why are fossil fuels bad? Climate change. The world is going to die. We're all doomed. Hurricanes, desertification, mass extinction. Carbon is bad. Okay. Republicans do not agree with this. It is a debatable issue that we may never get effective political action on because it's divisive. However, there's an issue that is not debatable. Ocean acidification. We can very clearly see the effects of this today. The ocean is a giant carbon sponge. Indeed, it maintains an equilibrium with the carbon dioxide that is dissolved in the atmosphere. And you can watch as this dissolved carbon becomes carbonic acid and successively lowers the pH of the ocean. You know, in, in Revelation, it talked about the oceans becoming as blood. Well, we're certainly proceeding towards the pH of blood. So maybe that was a little bit prophetic in a way we didn't realize, you know. God may not have to bring an apocalypse. We'll bring it ourselves first. But you can, you can see, like, off the coast, like right outside Los Angeles, there's tons of animals that are washing up, starving to death. Baby sea lions. They're starving. We've, we've killed the ability of plankton to form their shells and go from a larval to a mature stage. You can see it now. You can see the starfish melting off of the coast of, of Oregon and Washington State now. This, this is obvious. It is not debatable. At current rates of acidification, if we do not affect a change that decarbonizes our energy economy before 2050, you will go through a mass extinction event in the oceans. I mean, we're, we're experiencing it now. And this is, you know, this has precedent in history. Whenever the oceans acidified, 95% of life in the ocean died. We'll be left with jellyfish. Okay, so there's obviously some problems. So let's see what these people want us to do about it. If you deny climate change, Bill Nye will rip you a new one. He's a beast. Beware the Bill. Also, we'd like to avoid poor people from cooking with poop. This is in the bottom corner. That's, that's a source of fuel and a bunch of fuel slapped onto the wall drying. I mean, imagine that, like coating like the south wall of your house with poop, and that was how you cook dinner. <laughs> Third world problems. Okay, so what are the green solutions? We got all these prophets. They're selling us a religion. You know, Amory Lovins thinks that biofuels and energy efficiency can do it. Um, Mark Jacobson's like, he's selling some wind and solar. You got this Julio Freeman. He works for the coal industry, and he's very excited to tell you about carbon sequestration. And then good old lovable Elon Musk. Electric vehicles, energy storage. Okay, so let's look at biofuels first. Um, they produce the most CO2 per kilowatt hour. They're the most polluting forms of fuels. White people used to burn biofuels. Thankfully, we've transitioned to coal and natural gas that do burn cleaner. There are more trees now in America because we burn coal instead of wood. So we're, we're going like, to regress. I mean, we, we cut trees down in Brazil, in America. There's, there's an industrial association of wood chip creation that's satisfying these German renewables targets. I mean, we, we make wood chips here in America from American trees, ship them to Europe, and burn those, and that's renewable energy. Um, so energy efficiency. Now, you know, sure, maybe you can save some energy. Amory Lovins is the kind of guy that shows up at a dinner with a shake flashlight and, like, is so proud about how he's teaching his daughter to shake the shake flashlight, and that's going to, like, save some energy. You know, I mean... Okay? I don't care. Like, let's cut America out completely. It's irrelevant because the developing world are the ones that are building 10,000 new dirty brown lignite coal plants. Us saving energy is squat. In fact, you want to consume more energy because the energy we consume is directly related to our quality of life. And people burn poop to cook dinner. 
Okay, the so carbon capture and sequestration. The coal industry loves this because it means you burn 150% coal in order to produce the same amount of energy and the government will pay you to put a giant scrubber stack and to do all this crap to your coal plant in order to allow it to capture the CO2. So all the taxpayers pay for this. Then you pump the CO2 underground. Well, you hope you better hope it never leaks out because when Lake Nyos in Nigeria had all the CO2 bubble out of it, it killed all the living creatures um, in the valley, in the, in the village in the valley next to the lake. And this is, this is a bunch of dead things because CO2 is a heavy gas and stays near the ground. And, and so they may be able to engineer this away but it's still, we're still going to consume far more fossil fuels at a higher rate. You know, a poor country is not going to do this. They're going to get the cheapest form of power. This is like, this is some first world fantasy. Okay, energy storage. I, I was talking with somebody this morning um, in preparation for this talk, and they believed that batteries created energy. Okay, no, no, that's real. That's the perception is that, oh, I'll put a battery on my house and that's green. Why is that green? Your electric vehicle is going to run off of coal. Comprende? It's, it's only, it stores energy. So it's going to necessarily add some amount of cost because charging and discharging energy storage wastes a certain amount of energy. You know, the best batteries and charging systems can run 85 to 90% efficiency. So that both ways is around a 75 to 80% efficiency. So let's automatically increase the energy that everyone uses to put batteries on our homes by 20%. It's just, it's not an effective solution. You know, they're talking about making batteries with aluminum. What's the most energy intensive metal to make? Aluminum. All right, so distributed renewables. It's the sun, stupid. Solartopia. Naomi Klein is about to cry. She will break out in buckets of tears. I mean, look at this woman. She wants you to build some solar panels. So we could do that. We could bulldoze hundreds of square miles of beautiful desert and put up a bunch of panels that... You know, you'd have to wipe the bird crap off of them every day before they killed all the birds. Um, stupid. You know, and like, what are poor people going to do? They burn poop to cook dinner. They're not going to build a bunch of solar panels. They're going to build something that is as low cost as possible. You know, we, we, we basically in the first world are saying to the third world, F you, we've already consumed all the carbon, guys. Whoopsie you're gonna have to like actually stop burning poop too because you can't burn anything. Just don't have dinner. I mean, either we kill everybody or we find a way to solve this problem at low cost. Okay, and, and, and you know, it's obvious. I mean, you can look, even, even Robert F. Kennedy, you know, he's a board member of Bright Source who built the Ivanpah um, solar farm on, on the border of Nevada, you know? I mean, he admits that wind and, and solar, you know, these things, they're basically natural gas plants. You know, um, the, the cost of integrating renewables makes your, the energy you produce skyrocket. I mean, people throw out numbers and cost of production and all this stuff. I mean, what is the data? What is reality? There's a lot of people selling you a line, okay? What's really happening? What is the cost? I mean, you know, if you like to roast turkeys, you know, if you enjoy watching things die, maybe solar power's for you. Um, wind turbines, you know, the, 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 the pressure wave that comes off a wind tar turbine will actually, like, detonate the inside of a bat's lungs. I mean, sure, wind power doesn't kill a large percentage of birds, but the thing is, it's not pigeons flying into a window in a city. It's killing valuable raptors and valuable bats that actually keep mosquito populations down. I mean, uh, they're having problems up in Massachusetts because of wind taking out the bats, and so like they're having like this big mosquito problem. I mean, it, it, so how much do renewables produce? We build X 
capacity of wind. And this is what really gets me. It's people like, oh, Germany was 50% wind powered. Well, sure, maybe at some point during the day for five minutes, 50% of the energy consumption for Germany was being generated by wind. But on average, wind only generates 17% of the rated capacity. Okay, on very few occasions in certain select locations, the capacity factor can reach, you know, 35 or 40 percent, but that's not typical. And you can have weeks at a time where the wind just doesn't blow. Now, why is this important? Well, because when you consider the fact that we use natural gas to back up wind turbines, I need at least a around a 33, 34 percent capacity factor for that to even be carbon negative. Okay, because that backup gas generator it's not off when the wind is blowing. It's spun up at around a 20 to 40% load, and we're keeping it spinning at a very low load, a very inefficient operating point where it's consuming a lot of fuel and hardly generating any power. Just so when the wind suddenly dies or a cloud rolls over the solar panels, I can kick my natural gas turbine on very quickly. So, you know, they say renewables will reduce carbon by X, and it's really, you know, in best cases, 0.5X, typically 0.2X, if it's not carbon positive from when you consider the manufacturer. Okay, so some people are like, oh, well, if we just spread the wind turbines out over a large area, they'll kind of balance out. Well, lo and behold, that's not true. Because if you know anything about weather, you realize that weather is not a Gaussian distribution. You do not randomly have wind blowing in X, Y, and Z. You have fronts move through an area. I mean, this is common sense. And this is showing that obviously when the wind is blowing strong in Germany, it tends to blow strong in Britain and everywhere else because it happens to be like a cloudy, stormy day across most of Europe. I mean, it's just the, the assumptions that were made in deploying renewables are being proven drastically false. So, you know, for the sake of argument, let's assume we take all the money we spend on warfare and immediately apply it to solving the energy problem by going green. You know, storage, pinwheels, wind turbines, uh, solar panels, the whole bit. Could it work? Okay, so this is a graph of the frequency in Oklahoma where they've put a number of wind turbines. You can see the frequency is varying far more drastically than the grid around it. Now, now, why is this? We have to look at the structure of the grid real quick. So here in the bottom right, you have uh, the, these little round circles with a squiggly line or generators. You, these little down arrows might be a substation serving, you know, 10,000 houses or whatever. So, you know, a number of generators and substations is kind of an isolated area in the grid. And so the frequency within this area kind of rises and falls. And I'll assign one of these generators to be my frequency balancer. So I have this load that I predict, and then I set each of my generators at a certain uh, point, and then the rest of it is made up with one generator. Now, this is difficult because this introduces waves. So this, this frequency varying um, causes oscillations in the grid. And the speed and the damping of this wave is determined by the system inertia. And you can show that putting renewables on the grid reduces the inertia. Um, there's this factor beta, which is um, uh, megawatts per millihertz. So it's how much a certain deviation in load changes the, um, the amount of frequency that the grid sees. And you can show that over the last 20 years, the frequency is drastically reduced. You know, in, in this term over here, H is the inertia of my system. So the velocity that waves are propagating depends on that inertia is one over the square root. Um, now, now this in the bottom right is a, a um, disturbance um, created at bus one. And um, you can see how that wave propagates through a network. So basically, you, we have to have some kind of control system to balance this out. So you have flexible AC transmission systems, switched impedances, 
power flow controllers, science, 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 really complicated, really expensive. Okay, so there's a really good paper from Hierarchical to Open Access Electric Power Systems by Illick, you know, MIT, super smart woman. Um, basically, the takeaway from this is if we're going to integrate a distributed grid, you're going to need distributed control signals. We're going to have to go away from having one box that's a computer at my power station that I have a guard sitting in front of it with his gun that no one can hack into because it's not connected to the internet, to having this giant grid that's fully interconnected. You can't even firewall this thing, right? Like, the, you know, how are we gonna secure this system? You know, th this, this guy, Robert Hinden, you know, believes that the risks of the smart grid are undoubtedly higher than traditional system security problems. You know, the grid is being attacked now. 40% of the attacks are against the grid. If we go to war with China and have a smart grid, they could do something like this, you know, maybe hack into one of those switched impedance systems where if it's on or if it's off, the grid is stable. But they can switch back and forth between this and destroy generators and knock things off, off offline, you know. Um, we're, we're, we don't even really have effective theories to talk about resilience of the grid under the effect of cyber attacks. I mean, you want to give it another 10 years to maybe come up with a theory to talk about how reliable a cyber physical system is? I mean, this is, we have 30 years, we have under 30 years to solve this. I don't have a decade to wait on you to come up with some theory and models to where we can start designing the systems that, da, 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 you know. Okay, so a review. Poor people currently burn poop, want to go to brown coal. Hydroelectric is kind of at a maximum. Fossil fuels are increasingly expensive due to lower EROI. If we don't transition from them in under 30 years, we're all going to die. And distributed and intermittent renewables are extremely expensive, will never be integrated reliably, and pose critical security risks. So, two burning questions. Why are we spending trillions on unworkable solutions? Is there a workable solution? Let's go back to the future to find the answers to these. Shh, Marty. 1962, a report presented to John F. Kennedy. I'm going to do an impersonation now. The development of civilian nuclear power involves both national and international interests of the United States. At this time, it is particularly important that our domestic needs and prospects for atomic power be thoroughly understood by both the government and the growing atomic industry of this country, which is participating significantly in the development of nuclear technology. Specifically, we must extend our national energy resources base in order to promote our nation's economic growth. What was in this report? A plan to decarbonize America. In fact, by the year 2000, it was fully predicted that we would no longer be using coal as a major source of energy in America. This is Glenn Seaborg. This is a man. This is a man from back when America still had testicles. He was a badass. Now, at the end of this report, there were some interesting findings. There's a section entitled, The Coal and Transportation Industries. Concern has been expressed lest conversion to nuclear power might cause severe dislocations in the coal industry, and hence in transportation, especially the railroads. In the newspapers, the coal industry overwhelmed, atom, atom power assailed, coal producers asked for U.S. to end the program. The fossil fuel industry and their allies suddenly had real competition. No business goes down without a fight. Business 101, barriers to entry. What did they do? They cooked up the green meme. This is an early ad that was put out at Shoreham Nuclear Power Plant, okay? Um, Shoreham, they built it. It was fully functional. They never turned it on. After the industry spent billions of dollars to build a nuclear plant that environmentalists prevented from ever turning on, they were scared away from building a new nuclear plant in America for 40 years. Who sponsored this ad? The Oil Heat Institute. Um, I, 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 please go check out a documentary called Shoreham. Um, Penn and Teller uh, had a little bit to do with it, got on and did some interview. Awesome dudes. I would love to give y'all a high five sometime, like 
appear in my closet by magic someday or something. Um, you know, uh, also check out the documentaries Pandora's Promise and The Thorium Dream. Okay, so like, what, what keeps this paranoia propagating? Uh, uh, crap like this. People share this on Facebook. It's a map of the radiation from Fukushima. No, it's not. It's a map of the wave height that came out of the tsunami. I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's a huge, powerful force that is keeping us afraid of nuclear. You know, uh, uh, review IRS Form 990s on the following foundations. See who's funding Bill McKibben, you know. Show me the money. Who is opposing nuclear? Where is the fossil fuel industry putting its interests? You know, take, take like conservative greens, you know. Like uh, 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 th this guy, um, uh, T. Boone Pickens, he is very interested. I mean, he, he spent like a billion dollars on wind power, right? And now he lost a whole lot of money, so he's transitioning into natural gas. Why? Because natural gas supports wind, and you'll also be able to export it around the world. Um, you know, uh, people don't know that wind energy depends on fossil fuels. You're, you're building a fossil fuel plant that happens to not run 20% of the time. Um, oh, come on, go. Um, like the, the Rockefellers, you know, the Standard Oil legacy. Um, you know, they're, they're all their funding, you know, they're, they're funding biofuels, they're funding wind, they're doing all this stuff. I mean, come on, come on, listen to the money. Um, the, the Koch brothers, you know, it, it's, it's such a powerful paradigm. They got people as green or anti-green. So by funding both sides of this public debate, where you have solutions A and solutions B over here, you prevent any effective change from happening. This is just how they keep politics locked down with Democrat versus Republican. You know, the trillions they make every year versus the hundred million they can spend funding X, Y, or Z to, to affect some political action. I mean, it's chump change to them. You know, what I won't make in a lifetime is nothing for them to spend in a month. Okay, it even happens today. You know, the coal industry is in Australia is effectively keeping Australia from going nuclear. Can't lose the jobs. We got to send people down into a coal mine so they might get trapped in a, a cave-in or like breathe a bunch of coal dust into their lungs. I mean, do these look like happy workers to you? Maybe they would rather work at a nuclear plant where they could go outside and smoke or something or have a sandwich in the sunlight. You know, and, and, and like, what's the effects of this? Well, um, nuclear gets shut down. It's getting priced out of the market by mandated wind integration and the subsequent natural gas that supports it. Nuclear can effectively turn down its production randomly in order to match renewables. So last year, no less than five nuclear plants got shut down. Um, the German industry, you know, they shut down a lot of their nuclear. I mean, you can watch the carbon emissions increase, and we're getting green. We're getting green, and all we're getting is more black. It's, it's insane. You know, you have to get beyond the meme. You know, has nuclear ever worked before in, I don't know, Ontario or France? I mean, they obviously effectively decarbonize their economy. You know, a little bit of fossil fuel left, but whatever, you know. It's largely nuclear now. We could have done the same thing. You know, you, um, you need to go to atomicinsights.com slash smoking dash gun and, and really check out some of um, Rod Adams' work in this area. He's a stand-up guy. You know, he wants to build, like, nuclear train engines and, and, and really cool stuff. I mean, there's this wonderful future we could have. We can go to Mars. We can go to the moon. We can feed everybody. We can do it. You know, and, and just like, is nuclear safe? Obviously. It's obviously safe. Okay, the three major nuclear incidents, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and Fukushima. Three Mile Island and Fukushima killed zero people from radioactivity. Chernobyl killed like 49 people and maybe caused 5,000 additional cancers. I mean, when you look at the facts, it's just not deadly. Fossil fuels kill seven and a half million people a year. You know, everything has some risks. Sure, it's spooky. You know, Homer Simpson is a dummy and he's going to spill donuts on your nuclear control panel. I mean, that's, that's the nuclear that's getting broadcast at you. Break through the meme. Um, America the cuckold idiot. We're going to help China and Russia build nuclear power. We certainly won't do it. I mean, how, how pathetic as a nation can you get? This is painful. 
you know, wind is wealth. Sure is, just not, not for you toots. You know, I mean, who, who's getting wealthy off of this? Instead of saving the earth, we murder it. Instead of loving the poor, we let them choke to death. Instead of protecting life, we send the birds and the bats through giant blenders. Instead of utopia, this is your new world order. A pile of crap. It didn't have to be like this. Thank you.